If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 19, verses 17 through 30. So I chose this account because my name is John. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, now I'm going to begin reading. If you don't have it, I would say raise your hand, but our Connect team is on break. But you can Google it, so Google it. Um, so let's look at John, chapter 19, verses 17 through 30. It says, And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Gagatha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest said, that, so the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lot for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, their wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, which Jesus saw his, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hypsop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray one more time. God, we thank you so much for your holy word. Um, as I prepare this to speak, God, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. I thank you as we look at this text, God, that you are bringing it alive for us in this moment, God, on this Good Friday where we remember what you did for us at the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for a few moments, I want to speak to you from the topic, it is finished. So Easter is coming up this Sunday. I'm very excited about Easter. Growing up, we always had Easter traditions. Um, we would go to Mississippi, and every night, the Saturday night, no matter what time we got there, we would dye eggs. Does anybody still dye eggs? All right, we have a lot of big kids in the room. Um, we, we would dye eggs, and my grandmother, she'll be sitting on her sofa watching in the heat of the night or watching one of those old shows, or Texas Ranger, Walker the Texas Ranger. Anybody from Texas in the building? I don't like Texas. Um, no, <laughs> I love you, love you. But no, she'll be sitting there, she'll be watching her TV show, and we'll be dying the eggs, and we'll be talking, getting ready for Easter Sunday. Now, my grandmother lived in the country, so for Easter Sunday, and this was a Baptist church too, so for Easter Sunday, if you go to a Baptist church on Easter Sunday, you had to be dressed nice. I'm talking suits, the ladies have the hats on, you have to be dressed to the T. So I'm excited to see Dustin in a suit on Sunday. Anybody wanna see Dustin in a suit? All right, there you go, Dustin. <laughs> um, me too, I don't wear suits. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I have some suits, I might put one on. But, so, we would be there and we'll get ready, we'll dress and we'll go to the church and to make it even more serious of how much you had to dress up. If you go to a Baptist church in the country, you really have to be dressed up. 
So I have my, my suit on. Yep, I have an A-man over here. I have my suit on. My mom, she has her dress on, her hats, and we'll go to the service. And every single Sunday at this church, this pastor was an old pastor. He'd be in this preacher's voice. And he, he every Sunday we went up there, even when it wasn't Easter, he'll be like, and Jesus died on Friday. And he'll keep going until people started shouting back. And he'll be like, but early Sunday morning. And he'll go, early, early, early. And he'll keep saying early until you said amen. So you just have to say amen so he quit saying early. And he'll say, he got up. So on this Easter Sunday, he really had a ballpark full day with this saying. So he'd go and we went through it. And then after Easter would be over, my grandmother, she'll be so happy. She had eight kids, tons of grandkids. We'll all be there. We'll go back to the house and we'll have these Easter egg hunts and they will hide money in the eggs, which was really fun. Until they hid an egg that had $100 in it, and they, nobody could find it. <laughs> and I was out there all night trying to find it. Some days I go back walking through that field, still looking for it to help with my student loans. Um, but we'll hide these eggs, and then my grandmother, she'll just be so happy. The family's there. She's just smiling. And it was such a great Easter memory for me. And after several years, my grandmother, she started getting sick. And she started going in and out of the hospital. And when she started getting sick and going in and out of the hospital, she would tell things to my brother and myself and us, how much she was like, man, I love y'all. So proud of y'all. Keep going. Keep keeping God first. And she would tell us these things. And it seemed the more sick she got and the closer to the end she got, the more intentional were the words that she communicated to us. All the way up to the very end. And in our passage, we see Jesus all the way at the very end before his death. And he says, it is finished. Now we think about this idea of things being it is finished. I want us to, to look at this word because this word is translated from the single Greek word to telestai. To tell us that. And the reason why this is important when he says it is finished is because this word is in the perfect passive indicative grammatical structure. It sounds really a lot, like a lot. I have an English teacher snapping her fingers. I guess that's her amen. Snap, snap, baby. Um, <laughs> so, no, this is important. It was a perfect passive indicative grammatical structure. It is perfect tense in the sense of what is being spoken about is in progression and it's coming to a completion when he says it is finished. Everything that God was trying to do to redeem us back to him, to reconcile us back to him, it is finished in this moment. But because it's in the perfect tense, it means that the impact of it still continues to move on. And Jesus, he dies on the cross and he says, it is finished. And he uses this word. And in the perfect tense, it's so important to us because it means the grace that he stood in our place for on the cross is still available to us today. So we see that it's in the perfect tense. We see that it's in the passive tense, which means that the subject is being acted upon by outside things. So we look at this. Jesus doesn't say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. That work that the triune God had began, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to redeem man back to him, it is finished in this moment. And it's indicative because the person who is saying this is saying it from perspective of something being a fact. Jesus doesn't say, I hope it's finished now. He doesn't say, it might be finished. He says, it is finished finished. So we think about this saying, it is finished. A lot of us, we start things and we can't say it is finished. January was just right around the corner. Some of us started diets and we're not on the diets no more. So maybe we can say it is finished because we quit it, <laughs> but it's not finished because we've completed it. Some of us have started, have started the F260 Bible reading plan and we fell off track and we might be saying, it is finished because you've given up already. Catch up. It's only five days a week. But we see it is finished. We see this, and we see the, all these things that we start. But Jesus starts something that he finishes. 
So every month, I get so excited at the end of the, each month, and I can say that about this month. At the end of every month, I'm able to say it is finished when I think about the Vintage Nights. It's a good thing. Vintage Nights is an awesome outreach. We're reaching so many unchurched people in the uptown area. It's an awesome opportunity. But in planning for the Vintage Nights, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we get the worship team together. We get a live painter. We get the food together. We get all these things together, but every single time we have a Vintage Nights, one thing never seems to fail. There's an area, there's a void, there's a weakness in our system, and that is we always get the graphic late. Now, it's not our team. We have somebody else that's helping. Our team is on it. And what will happen is two weeks before the Vintage Nights, I will ask, I will say, hey, how's the graphic? And they'll say, oh, I'm working on it. I was like, okay, I wanted to put it up so we can start promoting it, but I'll give you some more days. A couple days later, I hit them up. Where's the graphic? Oh, I'm still working on it. I'm like, what does it take to do a graphic? So she says, I'm working on it. A couple days later, I'm working on it. And then eventually, about five or six days before the vintage nights, after Pastor Bricks texted me a million times asking for it for our social media account, I get a text message saying, it is finished. And I'm like, yes, it's finally finished. We put it on, we promote it. And as it relates to humanity, as it relates to the depravity that we're in, as it relates to the brokenness that we are is surrounding us, as it relates to us trying to be um, made right with God, made in right standing with God, as it relates to all of these things, I can look through scripture and I can just hear God saying, I'm working on it. When, he's, when, when God's trying to redeem us, I can see when he saves Noah and his family, I can hear him saying, I'm working on it. When God calls Abraham, I can hear God say, I'm working on it. When he, calls, when he calls Jacob, I can hear him say, I'm working on it. When he delivers the children of Israel, I can hear him say, I'm working on it. When he calls Moses, when he gives us the Ten Commandments, I can hear him say, I'm working on it. And then we see Jesus come, and I can hear him saying, I'm working on it. And then Jesus lives a perfect life, and I can hear God saying, I'm working on it. I love you so much, and I'm working on it. And right here on the cross, we finally hear Jesus say, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. What is finished? There's a couple things I want us to look at. One thing that's finished is the perfect fulfillment of the law of God. The perfect fulfillment. In Matthews, it tells us that, that, that Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. It is finished. Jesus lives a perfect life because he lives a perfect life and he fulfills the law. He is the perfect fulfillment for the law of God. The next thing that is finished is the appropriation of our sin. So if you look at this word to appropriate, it means to gain or regain the favor or goodwill of. So as Jesus dies for us in our iniquities, he pays for our sins. Now, I ask this question often, and usually not a lot of hands go up, but how many people have been to jail? Raise your hand. All right. It's the same two hands as last time, but I see a new hand this time. I'm not going to point you out. Um, I'm praying for you, sister. Um, <laughs> I've been to jail. Yes, I know. A pastor has been to jail. This was before I was a pastor. Um, <laughs> still qualified. Don't vote me out. Um, so... I've been to jail before. Now, it was a tough situation. Just so you know, it was for not paying a speeding ticket. So, not too bad. Um, but <laughs> the problem is, it would have been nice if I went to jail in St. Charles Parish because I live in St. Rose now. That would have been nice. You know, I heard it's not that bad. It would have been a little bit better if I would have went to jail in Kenner. The, the Kenner jail doesn't look that harmful. It looks friendly. But I went to jail in Orleans Parish Prison. Now, I don't know if you've seen those cell phone videos that came out last year or the year before. It's not nice. It's not nice at all. I was in there for two days. I went in a man. I came out a man. So the Lord is good. <laughs> you know, I'm an actor. I used to be an actor. So I just had to act like I was really hard in there. People are like, what you did? I'm like, 
What you mean? You know, I just basically had to do what I had to do to survive. So I went to jail. I got out of jail. But when I got out of jail, I had to go to court. And when I went to court, they told me, they said, John, you're guilty of these speeding tickets. You're guilty. You didn't come to court, all these things. There's this fine that you have to pay. And if you don't pay this fine, you're going back to jail. Thankfully, I was able to pay that fine. But imagine if I reached into my pocket to grab some money to pay this fine, and there was no money in my pocket. And as we think about God, as we think about the plan, the plan of salvation and redemption, as we think about these things, we cannot pay the debt that we owe for our sin. There's nobody in here that's good enough, that's holy enough, that's righteous enough to say, God, I know I messed up, but here, 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 take this. None of us can do that because we serve a holy and just God. But in his mercy, Jesus comes and Jesus can pay that for us. So what we see here, we see what is finished, the perfect fulfillment of the law of God, the appropriation for our sins. And we also see a path to reconciliation. A path to reconciliation. The best that we have to offer to God doesn't compare. It's not good enough. But when Jesus died on Friday, on Good Friday, when we think about what he did for us on the cross, that was good enough. I want us to look at this. We were never good enough. I want us to look at verse 20. Look at back at verse 20 if you have your Bible. Because there's something really stands out here that's symbolic to us not being good enough. It says, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. At this time, Latin. Latin was the language of, of the law. It was the language of the Roman citizens. The best that humanity had to offer when it comes to legal things, when it comes to the mind and putting laws in place, the best that man had to offer were, was written in Latin. Then we see it was written in Aramaic. This was the language of the religion. This was the language of the Jews. The best, the, the, at this time, the Jewish faith was the, was the pinnacle. It was the, the awesome. It was the greatest faith known to humanity up to this point. And it's not good enough because this language that it symbolizes is putting Jesus to death. Then we see it was also written in Greek, which was the language of culture. It was the language of beauty. We have so many great philosophers that come out of the Greek culture. So what we see here is the greatest that man had to offer in faith, the greatest that man had to offer in law, the greatest that man had to offer in culture, the greatest that we had to offer symbolically right here on the sign of Jesus wasn't good enough because it was putting our Savior to death. But Jesus gives us a path. He gives us a permanent path to reconciliation. So today, we call it today Good Friday. Why can we call it today Good Friday? Because the eternal work of Jesus has been completed, is complete, and will forever remain completed. We can call it today Good Friday because we were rebels and Jesus made us friends of God. We can call it today Good Friday because we were homeless, we were orphans, and God calls us his children. We can call today Good Friday because we were without hope, we were without peace, we were without joy, we were without grace, we were without righteousness, but Jesus came and he died for you and I. That's why we can call it Good Friday. We can call it Good Friday because Jesus said it is finished. And that statement echoes through eternity. It echoes to where we are. It echoes for the rest of the existence of humanity until we're all made one with God. It echoes 
and it's good news for me and you. So I want us to pray. And I don't want us to forget or take for granted why this is a good Friday. It is finished. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your cross. We thank you so much for being the perfect fulfillment of the law of God. We thank you so much for standing in our place, God. He who knew no sin took on sin, God, and we thank you so much. We don't take for granted what you did on that day. We don't take for granted the mercy, the grace, the peace that we have because of you, God. We thank you tonight. We gather here on this Good Friday just to say thank you, God. I know that we say thank you often, God, but we just gather in this moment to pause because we recognize if it was not for you, if it was not for you taking on our sins on the cross, there will be no way we could have a pathway back to God. So we thank you, Lord. We pray that as we prepare to celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, that you would be with us, God. I pray, God, that we never, ever take for granted what you did on the cross. That we never take it lightly, the cost that you paid for us. We were in trouble. We were lost. We were hopeless. But you didn't leave us that way. And for that forever be eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.